Good morning and welcome to Graduation Sunday. Graduation Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays. There's a couple reasons for that. The first one is we get to, to see our Sunday school kids move from one class to the next class. They get to see their new teachers. They get to, to be with some new classmates. And it's just a lot of fun for me. Um, seeing kids up front always brings me hope. Uh, this is, it's through this next generation that the gospel is going to continue forward. Our denomination actually calls them the now generation, and I think that's a pretty great name for them. Through learning what they learn today, they're, better, they're going to be better equipped to follow Jesus tomorrow and to share Jesus tomorrow, as we all are. I believe that biblical foundation is caught taught. Mom and Dad, your job is extremely important. Kids learn about Jesus by watching you and listening to you. You have a big responsibility. Your attitude towards things will be picked up and carried on by them. Your attitudes towards crisis will affect their response towards crisis. Your attitude towards forgiveness will be picked up by them too. Your response towards Jesus is the example that they will live by. If this time of social distancing has taught us anything, it's this. Through, your, through you and your relationship with Jesus, your child will be introduced to Jesus in a real and personal way. That can, also, that can mean closer to Jesus or further away from Jesus. It's also through your relationship with Jesus that your child may grow to trust Jesus. Trusting Jesus is caught and taught. We can't merely rely on the church to do this. The church is a resource for you as you do this. Responsibility is, work, is yours through your, your words and your actions. Before I head down this rabbit trail any further, we should move on because, quite frankly, I could talk about this all day. As we do every Grad Sunday, I want to have, or I have some people that I really want to say thank you to. First of all, I want to start off with Annette and her nursery team. Thank you so much for providing nursery for our kids on Sunday morning. Uh, seeing your caring volunteers really warms my heart, especially when I walk by those nursery doors and, and just watch them in there. Uh, Chris Tempast and Corey Dadema, you guys taught our JKSK class, and I've sat in on this class before, and it's just an absolute riot to be in there. And uh, these kids are so much fun to hang out with. Chris and Corey, you've done a done a great job with those kids. Uh, Bonnie Gallagher, she taught our grade one, two class, and I love seeing the creativity that comes into every single lesson that Bonnie teaches. Uh, she has more ideas than anybody that I have ever met. Uh, Bev Walden, she teaches our grade three, four class, and uh, these kids absolutely love her. I've uh, had the chance to fill in for her a couple of times uh, as the, when they've gone away, and I'm really not sure how she gets very much done in this class. Uh, these students have got to be some of the greatest storytellers I think I've ever seen. Diane Ban and Gerald Rogers teach our grade five, six class. And I love walking down the hall, past the window, and seeing them digging into God's Word together. There's nothing like looking through the window and seeing all of them sitting around the table together with God's Word open and just learning together. They got to learn words like propitiation and substitution and why these these big concepts are so very important. This really is foundational teaching is what we're doing here. Uh, Ange Campbell taught our youth class and she did an amazing job. Uh, this is a, a tougher class to teach because you have to have the educational part, uh, yet the practical and the enjoyable part. And uh, as a teacher, we have some teachers here, you would know grade seven, eight and high school classes are not the easiest classes to teach all the time, but she did an amazing job in spite of somebody who kept coming in and disrupting the class. I really also appreciate those who filled in for our teachers when they needed a week off. Thanks for just being part of our team. Let me assure you, we will be getting back together again. Um, but during this time apart, we're learning patience, aren't we? How are you doing with that? Are you learning patience well? So the second reason that I love Grad Sunday so much is that we get to celebrate some milestones with some of our students and their families. We get to see them up front. We get to bless them as a family. And I know that being up front for our students is not uh, really their favorite place to be, but it really helps us to know who you are and how we can be praying for you. 
Angie and I have some great stories and some great memories with some of our graduating students, and none of those stories will be shared today. So here's how today's going to go. First thing I'm going to do is work our way through our passage rather quickly today. It's, it's not a very long passage. Uh, then I have a little vid video made up to celebrate our grads that I want you to see, and then we're going to close with a prayer of blessing. So today is Philippians 1, 18 to 30, and Krista has already read that passage for us this morning. Before we get uh, too far into this this morning, I'd, uh, I'd like you to do something at home. I'd like you to give the opportunity to chat with each other, with those who are watching this, um, just about, about a certain topic, and here it is. Let's say, grade 12 students and grade, grade 8 students, that it's 15 years from now. So the grade 12 students, you'd be 32, 33, somewhere in there. So just a touch younger than me, really. Uh, grade 8 students, you'd be 26, 27, 25, somewhere around in there. And uh, you'd be, oh, maybe just establishing a career, maybe newly married, maybe thinking about getting married, maybe not. Um, I want you to ask yourself, when I'm 32 or 33, or when I'm 26, what would I like others to say about me? This is one of those chart the course of your life type questions. And, a, and an example, I'll give you an example just of something in my life that I learned when I was around 33, somewhere in that ballpark. This is something I learned. Relationships are always most important. Some people feel that being right is always most important, but sometimes pushing our rightness actually destroys the relationship. And we end up losing. Relationship is always most important. That's the one thing I learned when I started ministry, and that one has never let me down. Parents, if it seems like your kids are a little stumped by this question, please feel free to share with them a little bit of advice that you would have appreciated getting when you were finishing grade 8 or grade 12. Something that would have made a difference in your life 15 years later. So for me, if Alex asked me that question, I'd answer, I wish I'd had more patience. I know that would have made a huge difference in my life. Feel free to put some of your ideas on that live chat that's going to be up here beside, and uh, I'll be back in a couple minutes, and we'll dig into what Paul says to his friends and what he wants to teach them. So I want to welcome you back. I hope that exercise was a good one for you. I know that it was just a really quick time. A minute or two is not very long, really. And uh, my prayer is that this conversation is one that you will continue in the days to come. Let's head into our passage. I'm only going to break it into two parts today. So part number one, living with an eternal perspective. 
living with an eternal perspective. We're going from verse 18 all the way to the end of uh, verse 26. Uh, Paul the Apostle is writing to believers in the city of Philippi under house arrest in Rome. So Paul had a pretty uncertain future here. The arrest happened because the Jewish leaders were trying to kill him for basically he switched sides. That's what he did. He was a persecutor of the believers, and then he met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And then he became a powerful witness for Jesus. And because he became a powerful witness for Jesus, the, the Jewish leaders were out to get him. And after they arrested him, because Paul was a Roman citizen, he appealed to Rome, and they sent him to Rome, and now he's under house arrest. So that's the Coles Notes, the short, short Coles Notes version of uh, the backstory to go along with this passage today. If you want the whole, the whole account, Acts 20, that's your spot to start. So under house arrest, Paul's able to write to the churches that he started, and he's able to disciple some of the, uh, some of the people who became followers of Jesus um, through him. One would be Titus. Um, it was actually a real blessing for Paul to, to be under house arrest um, because the gospel was able to continue spreading because he pretty, pretty much had free reign to keep on writing. When you think about it, though, Paul could have had an entirely different attitude. He could have been really sour. He could have been really bitter. He could have resented his time uh, under house arrest. But that's really not what we read here. Instead, Paul is rejoicing. What Paul is saying is, either way, I'm good. Either way, I'm good, and God's got it in complete control. If I stand trial and they convict me, I get put to death. I get to go to heaven and be with Jesus. He calls it great gain, and I think he's right. Or, I stand trial, they let me go free, and I get to spend time with all the churches, and I get to spread the gospel even more. He wants to depart to be with Jesus, but if he sticks around, it's actually better for the, the early church. It's a pure, purely positive, godly outlook on life. A purely positive, godly outlook on life. Either way, I get to serve Jesus or be with Jesus. Either way, I'm good. Grads and all the rest of us, as we move forward in life, this really is the attitude that we need. How does God want me to move forward in my life? He wants me to adopt Paul's attitude. I long to be in heaven with Jesus, but while Jesus has me here, I must live every day in a way that others can see Jesus through me. That's Paul's attitude. All right, let's head into our, our second part. Verse 20, verses 27 to, to 30. Oftentimes when, we read Paul, when I read Paul's letters anyways, I get thinking, the way this guy thinks is way over my head. And it actually takes me a couple of runs at it occasionally just to, to really get into what Paul is really sharing here. But then there are times when Paul gets super practical. This next passage is Paul being practical Paul. It's actually the first in a list of commands and expectations that Paul gives to this church in Philippi throughout the rest of the letter. And here's his first command. He says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. As we read through our passage, this little, these few little verses, you're going to notice the word you or yourselves nine times. Well, depending on your translation, it'll be there about nine times. This is a plural you. So a better way to actually say this would, would be with a southern drawl would be y'all. Y'all conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I'm with you or absent, y'all you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Y'all stand firm in one spirit and in one accord. And here in chapel, we use this term church family a lot. The question is, how are you doing? How are we doing at standing together? Are we all in one spirit? Are we all in one accord, accord or... Are we wanting our own way? Paul is tackling a rather tough issue here because two prominent members of the church and two valuable co-workers in Paul's ministry were actually quarreling with one another. And their names are actually listed in chapter 4, verse 2. They were not standing together. They were not standing in one spirit. They were not conducting themselves 
in a manner worthy of the gospel. So what does it look like to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? My commentary says, this phrase that the NIV translate, conduct yourselves, is unusual and probably carries a deeper significance than is immediately apparent in most English translations. It occurs only twice in the New Testament, once here and once in Acts 23 verse 1. In other ancient Greek literature, it sometimes means to have one's citizenship or home in a certain city or state to rule or to govern that state or to simply live and conduct yourself as dot, dot, dot. So think of it this way. I'm a Canadian traveling to another part of the world. Do people know I'm a Canadian by the way I am? I hope so because Canadians actually have one of the nicer reputations in the world. So when it says we're to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, what it's saying is our lives are to be lived out as a representative of the gospel to a world that is watching. Our lives are to be lived out as a representative of the gospel to a world that is watching. Okay, so let's take that and put it back into the context of the passage here. How are we doing this? out or how are we doing this living this out in the lives of our with our church family remember i said that the yous in this passage are all plural so that's where paul's starting he's starting with the church family if we can't stand together and uphold each other together we're not being good representatives of the gospel if we can't stand together and uphold each other together we're not being good representatives of the gospel to our grads and our students who are celebrating with us today, you may think that this point doesn't really apply to you, but it actually really does. If you can establish this idea in your mind at your age that the church, that we need to stand together as a church family, then the churches that you will be a part of in the future will be much healthier, much more productive, and much more in line with this passage you will be much more likely to be part of a church family that conducts themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So let's wrap this up for another Grad Sunday. Here's the highlight reel. Paul's two instructions to live by. Number one, your attitude moving forward is extremely important. Paul had every, attitude, or every reason to have a sour and brutal attitude. Instead, he looked at life as this. Either way, I'm good. On the one hand, I get to go and be with Jesus in heaven. On the other hand, I get to serve Jesus. Either way, I'm good. So my prayer for you this week is that you would adopt that attitude. This is not an easy thing to do, but with some work and a lot of time with God in prayer and a lot of time in God's word, it can happen. I know this because I'm seeing this in some of you. And to you, I say, keep it up. Number two. Remember who you represent. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus. How are you doing at living as a representative of Jesus? Does he show through you at all times? Would the world around you say, they see Jesus living through you, no matter how old we are, we can learn to be more like Jesus. Is this going to be a struggle? I know it is. Uh, remember, it's all about trajectory. When a plane takes off, it doesn't immediately get to 30,000 feet. It takes time to climb, right? And as you're climbing, there's going to be ups and downs and ups and downs, the same way as we grow in our relationship with Jesus. There's going to be ups and downs, but Jesus is always there. We are not a perfect people. We sin and we feel distant from him, but he is always there to forgive us and pull us closer to him and to teach us to be more like him. My prayer for you this morning, may you know how much God loves you and may his goal for you to be, and may you know that his goal for you is to be more like Jesus in all you say and all you do. So let's close our time off together with a little uh, slideshow of the grads who are graduating. Just so you know, you may not know all of these students but they're all part of our church family. One thing that we like to stress to our, our students in youth ministry is that they know that this is their church family. 
please remember to be praying for them. Some of our grade 12 students are heading off into post-secondary education. Some of them are, are heading off into apprenticeships and others are heading off into jobs. Please remember to be praying for them. Also remember to pray for our grade 8s. They're heading off into high school, which brings its own set of issues with it. So be praying for them too. Let's watch, it, watch this little slideshow together and uh, then I'll close us off in a, a word of prayer.
Will you join me in prayer as we bless our grads? Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can spend some time together as a church family, blessing our graduating students. We pray that you would be close to those who are heading off to post-secondary education or off into apprenticeships or off into jobs, that you would, you would guide them and direct them and show them the path that you would have for them. We pray that you would, that they would trust you more and more and that they would grow in deeper relationships with you more and more. We thank you for their parents and uh, the way that their parents are, are standing beside them and uh, supporting them. We pray that they would continue to do that. We pray that as they, as they mature, that all they say and all they do would be honoring to you and that you would become the center, the center of their lives. We thank you for this morning. We thank you that uh, you're here with us no matter where we are. And we thank you that you love us so much. And we pray all these things in your, in your most awesome name. Amen.